You know, I just think of uh, Brian Patton and Bart from the Canadian Rockies Trail Guide who got to lug a wheel around out here and do all these hikes for their books. And, you know, Brian and I, uh, we email and he continues to work on updating the trail guide. And unfortunately, updating the trail guide these days means decommissioned trails, decommissioned campsites, stuff like that. I made Evelyn plan the trip. She wanted to do the North Boundary and I made her plan the entire trip and she put sticky notes on the map to remind her what the Canadian Rockies Trail Guide said. And it's really good that she did because I left my Canadian Rockies Trail Guide <laughs> laminated pages in the car. Well, this is what you get when you leave your Canadian Rockies Trail Guide pages in your truck. There's a bridge across Twin Tree Creek. The Canadian Rockies Trail Guide is an absolute must when planning and doing these types of hikes. Even though YouTube videos are out now, like, like you know, ours from the southbound, we kind of show it everything, you got to have the book. And the last thing I want to do is I want to give a shout out to Brian Patton uh, at the Canadian Rockies Trail Guide. Uh, Brian and I email, you know, a few times a year. We chat about different things. Uh, and I just love the guy and think his knowledge and, and stuff of these mountains is unparalleled. And I'm jealous, as I said earlier in this video, of the life they were able to lead uh, as younger men. Do you sit back ever and reflect on the impact you and Bart had on people like me. Hey, Stuart here. We're not going to find out how's the hike. We're going to find out how's the book with Brian Patton and the Canadian Rockies Trail Guide. The Canadian Rockies Trail Guide. <laughs> I call it the Bible of backpacking, and without it, I likely never would have ventured into some of the backcountry areas I've explored. In fact, the Canadian Rockies Trail Guide has been part of my world since my first edition in 1991. Over the years, Brian and I have struck up a virtual friendship, discussing everything from trail conditions, mileages, markers, and life in general. So what a thrill. A thrill for me to finally meet him in person and sit down for an hour-long chat near his home in B.C. It was even more of a thrill after the interview to receive a surprise gift of a signed copy of the latest edition and then to discover my name in the acknowledgments. Oh, <laughs> thrilled indeed. Thank you, Bart. Thank you, Brian. Your book has opened up backcountry wonders to generations of backpackers, cyclists, day hikers, trail runners, and adventurers worldwide. And our world is a better place because of it. All right, first of all, I have to say, I feel like I'm meeting somebody I've admired for a long time. I mean that. <laughs> you know, we talked a little bit earlier, just, just chatting as we were driving about, you know, being a little bit of a celebrity. It happens when you write a book, yeah. right? So I thank you for this. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, How'd you get here? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we started this book around the time you were born, I think. <laughs> I'm pretty old. I don't know about that. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, well, <laughs> like I say, it's the 50... First edition that yeah. just came out, 51st year this year. It's Congratulations on that. The longest running trail guide in probably in, in North American history. Mm. Uh, well, with the exception of the White Mountains down in uh, the northeastern United States. Right, of course, right. But the Appalachian Mountain Club ke has kept that alive. I'm thinking for, White Mountains, is that New Hampshire? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah White yeah, Mountain, yeah. and uh, that's 115 years that uh, their trail guide has been going. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they've had as many changes as yours. Well, no, and uh, under the same two authors, too. That's the other thing that right. has been unusual. Yeah. No, originally I, I started my hiking career when I was 18 years old and uh, went up to Glacier Park, uh, Montana. Mm -hmm. and was working in a hotel there and we had one day off a week and we got paid some ridiculously low salary <laughs> most days. Right, right. But we always went hiking and that's where my hiking career started when I was 18 because yeah. that was what everybody did. And Park. So was it a passion once you got out there? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and with all of us, it was uh, all, all the, the kids that were around in those days, uh, it, it was really the only thing to do. Right. <laughs> was, you know what? Right. No, no television. No iPhones. No, no radio. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then I eventually became a seasonal park ranger there in Glacier. And, oh, uh, that'd be great. Two, two summers of doing that. and, and that, that led to the Canadian Rockies because I suddenly realized that the uh, Glacier National Park in Montana was really the southern end of the Canadian Rockies. Mm, right. And the uh, Banff became a, 
I, I've been to Bath as a, as a kid, you know, a teenager with my parents, and uh, I just decided I wanted to move here. And so uh, that, the rest was history. You right, know, I, right. I came up to Bath and was working on the ski patrol at Lake Louise for my first winter, and then went to work at the Book and Art Den in Bath, and that's where I met John White and Peter Steiner, who was the owner of the, uh, the, of the, the, of the store. Yeah, Den. yeah. And they, uh, when I decided to go out and do a trail guide, originally we were just going to do a trail guide to Banff National Park. Right, right. But uh, then when Bart Robinson came along, yeah, 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 <laughs> and he just sort of floated into Banff in those days, and he said, "Oh, would you like some help with the trail guide?" And uh, <laughs> then my brain started uh, turning over, and I figured. Well, we could actually do a trail guide for all the mountain parks, and including a few of the uh, trails in Essendon and Mount Robson as well. Right, which are in the book. But <clears throat> so let's just let's just stop there for a second. Let me ask you. So the germination of of doing a trail guide, how did that come into your mind? Well, trail guides were becoming popular, at that, okay. especially the comprehensive. Not comprehensive. Ours was one of the few comprehensive guides, but. Uh, down in the United States, for example, there were things like Wilderness Press in 1966. They published the first guide to uh, the Sierras down in, right. in, in, in California. Right, in California, yeah. And uh, the Mountaineers uh, started their publication program in uh, Washington State, and mm -hmm. that was in the late 60s as well. So it was pretty obvious. And then there was a guy named Jim Thorsell who was doing studies for Parks Canada in those mm -hmm. days. And Jim... Uh, who became a friend almost immediately when I when I came to Banff? Uh, he uh, he felt that part of one of his studies on Banff and Yoho Park when he was doing user studies there and seeing how many people were actually hiking the sure. trails then and which we weren't very many in these days. Right. Uh, that uh, what was needed was a good trail guide that would expand beyond the popular trails that Parks Canada was. Uh, Promoting. Right. And, uh, that hasn't changed any. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, now they've no. done come full circle, and now they're back and publishing their, their four trails that they, uh, not everybody could take, stay on. But um, <laughs> but at any rate, the idea was that if we did a comprehensive guide, we could possibly spread out the use and get people to be hiking in areas that weren't always just like the leaves or right. kind of mountain yeah. Yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. So that Expand was, and broaden their horizons, uh, right? So that was yeah. the idea behind it, and uh, we uh, we just sort of worked off of that. And when and like I say, when Bart came along, then the idea was certain parks like Kootenay and, yeah. and, and maybe even Waterton, or whatever, they wouldn't justify trail guides on their own. Mm -hmm. But uh, too it, small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, and and people did people come to the Canadian Rockies. They don't look at just Banff National Park. They look at Jasper. They look at Kootenay, and they look at Yoho. Well, they all run together. Yeah, yeah, they're, yeah. they're essentially one park. Right. And yeah. So, so is this the first edition? That's the first edition. Look at that. So, yeah. how long did this take to get to this form? One summer. What? <laughs> <laughs> Holy mackerel! Yeah, really? Yeah, I, I, I was working security at the Banff Springs Hotel the first winter that the Banff Springs Hotel was ever open. In the winter, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Winter yeah. and 69, 70, and uh, I would sit there on the old Underwood typewriter that they had in the, in the basement of the uh, where the security office was, and, yep. and I would be writing park superintendents and, and park wardens and such and saying, we'd like to do a trail guide and, yeah. and we'd like to come and see you first thing in the spring and sure and we want to get out there and do the trails yeah and of course part of the things of doing the trails in those days too was a lot of the trails were badly bad distances on them you know the wardens would estimate the, <laughs> the trail distances yes yeah. let me just say that if anybody watches my channel i'm complaining all the time about the <laughs> signage it's still not right oh no uh, <laughs> Parks Canada, <laughs> that's another story. How they, yeah. they, they tried to go out and measure the trails, and then they never could get, come up with the consistent distances for themselves. And then they decided, <laughs> there was one period in the 1980s when they decided, we won't put any distances on the trails, we'll just point the you're direction. Go, you're that. going this way, yeah. Molar <laughs> Pass, that way. Yeah. Uh, in fact, there are old ones like that. But um, <laughs> yeah. So, 
Well, that's my. That was. A, you've actually led me to the next question. Is you know how much cooperation with parks did you have to have? What was required? Like, and were they helpful? Well, most of the park superintendents, right off the bat, they, they saw this as an interesting new project. Okay. They, they saw it as something that might be positive, but they would hand this off to the chief park wardens, who would then hand this off to the park naturalists. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Help the, these guys out. There yeah. were very yeah. few wardens that took any interest in what we were doing. And in fact, they just thought it was a couple of crazy guys that were out there. Pushing a wheel around. Pushing a wheel around. <laughs> and that was it. We were out there trying to measure their trails to tell, tell, to, tell them exactly to, what the lake to, is. Tell people that, you know, these guys have estimated <laughs> these uh, distances on horseback. <laughs> Did they provide any historical information? Because, you know, you and I have talked about this before, mm -hmm. and you've sent me some information, but, you know, one of the things I love about the books, all the, all the editions, that, mine's green, the one I have, by the way, it's not blue, yeah. we'll show that one in a sec, but um, is the historical information you provide on a lot of the trails. Yeah. Where... How did you come up with this? Because it really adds a layer of um, of interest to somebody like me yeah. reading the historical parts of these uh, trails. Yeah, and uh, well, that was a, what sparked my interest in history of the Rockies. Mm. Uh, I always was kind of a closet historian, I guess, even before I came here. But I uh, I decided that we needed to fill out the trails. We went out there and we measured them all, yep, we yep. hiked them all, we, we got as much information as we could on some of the remote trails, which of course we couldn't get that to in those days. Yep. And uh, then I went to the White Museum of the Canadian Rockies, which had just opened, mm -hmm. and they were a real repository for history of, of the Rockies. They had the Alpine Club of Canada's collection yep. there, and, uh, and a lot of the early history books. And so I, I really got into the history of the Rockies and, and as a way of filling out the descriptions from our trails. Yeah, yeah I mean, it really makes a difference. Yeah. I mean, you and I were talking too um, about Athabasca Pass, which we'll touch on later. I mean, the history of that trail is the reason I wanted to hike it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? And the, the history of that trail is only known to me because I've read it in your yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was it, the early, that was what really interested me, who were the first white folks to see this. Yeah, and, exactly. And the first to describe these trails. Yeah. And so that was, um, well, as I mentioned, I traveled all across Canada in the next four or five years, mm. just uh, going to archives everywhere and putting together the history of not just the earliest fur traders, but the explorers and, and travelers yeah. who came after them in the 19th century. And it's brilliant. I mean, so the last question there, I mean, did you did you get that information before you went out or did you go out, see the trails and come back and as you're putting the book together, yeah. added that in? The winter okay. after we did our, our initial trail work, why yeah. then uh, we, uh, we got the background that we needed because you describe a trail, but you know you needed something of interest. <laughs> yeah. as, as the years passed, we got more and more left-right turn directions in there, <laughs> and, and the history started to, to wane a bit. Sure. You know, and, yeah. and also natural history. We, I had a background in natural history and forestry and geology, and so mm -hmm. I would try to stick a, a lot of notes in about that as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was just a way of. Uh, filling these things out so that it gave people more interest and, and, and more reason to be there. Oh, than, yeah. Than just, uh... <laughs> well, I mean, it adds layers of, of meaning to yeah. the trip. Yeah. Like if we talk, I'm not going to get into Athabasca Pass too much, but again, that's a historic trail. Yeah. That they're rebuilding from the other side in BC, actually, and it's almost finished. Yeah, and, and they were, they had a crew in there working on that trail. Uh, 30 years ago, I right. uh, was a park uh, naturalist up in uh, the north end of Banff Park, yep. and uh, they were doing a lot of work, and in fact, I was invited by one of the guys to, there was a couple Austrians who uh, wanted to do the entire trip, and they had lots of money, and so I was invited <laughs> to go along with them to hike the trail, and then they were going to have a float plane come in in the Wood River and pick us up. Nice! Well, that's very civilized. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was working for Paris Canada, and so I couldn't get break away that right. much but right. to do it. But, uh, yeah, so uh, that I I often think of too the South Boundary Trail, which I know you've done, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, South S. Karen, which yep. has a lot of history yep. behind it, and the South S. Family, the yep. 
the uh, the Earl of South Asker. Uh, yeah, the, the first Earl of guy, South yeah. Asker. Now they're his great great grand. Kids came and I climbed that peak a few years ago. Fantastic. To go up and visit the cairn. Yeah. He built this huge cairn on top of Oh, the I know. Cairn. When Evelyn and I were out there doing the whole trail, I couldn't see the cairn because it was yeah. raining. Yeah. But then when I went out and did another hike when I got snowed on, yeah. after the snow had everything had cleared, I, I finally got to see the cairn. I'll flash it up now. But yeah. imagine going up there and building this thing, like yeah. just for fun, right? <laughs> I mean, oh, let's go up and put a cairn on top yeah. of this. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. So, did you ever go out, and this just popped into my head here, did, did you ever go out and hike and not work on the book? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, we did, actually. Uh, one of the things we did uh, right after we became celebrities... Right. Uh, no, said, for sure. The, yeah. the book jumped right up on the, the bestseller list in southern Alberta. It yeah. was the only book that was ahead of it was P.R. Burton's The Last Spike. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, That's a front page challenge, a uh, little hint right there, actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and one of the people who helped us publish the book, John White, uh, decided that the Banff Centre should be doing more to introduce people to the Canadian Rockies, to where you came here to do arts programs and sure. to do all sorts of different things, but you, you can be doing that anywhere in, in Canada. Right. Uh, you should learn about the environment that you're, you're staying in during this summer session mm. and so we uh, for about seven years we had a course called Anatomy of the Canadian Rockies in which we would, we would do little lectures every day to the various students usually it was students in the things like pottery and, sure. and photography yep. because yep. Uh, the, the people that oh. were involved in uh, drama and uh, opera and things like that of right. course didn't have as much time to spend no but then on weekends we'd take people out hiking on, gotcha. on Saturday and we had a bus and yeah in fact one case we even had a boat that took us down Lake Marawaka so we could do uh, <laughs> Alma lookout and as a day trip we Beautiful. back and, yeah. uh, and so that those trips were not I didn't have my trail wheel with me, but, right. <laughs> but for the first 15 years and the first three editions of the trail guide, I estimate that I pushed the trail wheel most everywhere I went. And Any idea how many kilometers you pushed that wheel? Yeah, I, I kept track of it, but I can't remember right now. <laughs> <laughs> if you send it to me, I'll flash it up on the I, screen, I, I but it's it probably was, in the tens and tens of thousands. Oh yeah, I was... Uh, we're not as active really as some of the people like yourself these days, you know, because we, we went out and did things like the North Boundary Trail and right. the South Boundary Trail yeah. and a few remote trips and even a couple trails that don't exist anymore, like Mousson. <laughs> well, there's quite a list of those, yeah. actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're getting we'll get to that. Yeah, exactly. But uh, <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, most of the time I was always pushing that wheel. Actually, the first uh, summer we did it, we had a fellow in Banff who was a bicyclist, who was a, a Brit who came over and had a little bicycle shop in, in his uh, back garage. And uh, <laughs> I bought my first 10-speed bike from him. And uh, he made us uh, a trail wheel. Mm -hmm. I, speaking of park superintendents being helpful, uh, Steve Coon, who was the park superintendent in Banff in those days, he often did give us the uh, measuring wheel that they had for Parks Canada, which oh. was one of the standard survey wheels right. about this big around. Yeah. And I just felt that was way too small for traveling in the back country. You needed a, a 27 inch wheel, like a bicycle wheel, yeah. that would bounce over rocks. Easier and, to push. And, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, yeah, a lot easier. But the only thing that wasn't easy was we had banana bars on it, like the kids had in those days. Oh, really? Oh, <laughs> yeah. so it had handle, like had yeah, bars? Yeah. Okay, are you going to send me a picture? We're going to flash that up here. Yeah, yeah, well, it was just, it was handy in one respect. When I wanted to stop and take notes, I could just set it down and the handlebars would keep the wheel upright and everything like that. <laughs> but when you were pushing it, you and you had a heavy backpack. Yeah, that's right. And you couldn't really relieve yourself from the weight of the backpack as you were yeah. pushing along. Right. So after that first year, I redesigned the wheels. Both Mark and I had separate wheels because we did separate trips usually. Okay, you weren't always together. No, okay. very, very seldom. I didn't realize that. That was the only way we would, could cover could... that number of trails. Well, it's funny because <clears throat> when you said we did it all in one summer, I'm like yeah. thinking to myself, yeah. how much time? But okay, so you split up. Yeah, we would travel together to the parks and we'd go and meet the park superintendents and they, the naturalists, the wardens yep. and things like that. 
but then we would usually branch out. We only did about three, four trips together in that summer. And uh, but then in the subsequent years, I had that a single banana bar. Yeah, sure. <laughs> it was like a handle. Yeah. And then I could push it with one hand. Right. And uh, that was a lot easier. Though I don't know if I could do it today because. <laughs> right. Well, anything where you're holding your your body in a certain yeah. position, right? Yeah, you build up your wrist. <laughs> exactly. And especially when you get on some of those remote trails and you're hitting logs and yeah, <laughs> and exactly. Logs. Look, I mean, that's I didn't write this one down, but you come to some deadfall. What do you do with your wheel? Sometimes you just have to pick it up and, and cover. Roll it yeah. Over. Yeah. 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 Because I mean, a meter is not a big deal. Yeah. Right. Well, and it it really is quite accurate. You know, you figure that the wheel usually rolls over the log or mm -hmm. something like that so it it's not really uh, increasing the distance i've gone back and measured trails well in subsequent years i've gone to digital odometers because originally they were mechanical odometers right the bicycle click click used. click click yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, then i went to digital which was actually a little bit more iffy and uh, you had to watch that you didn't turn the thing off uh, but i've measured trails that i measured back when we did the first edition and <laughs> they come out exactly the same <laughs> and in fact I, I can still remember coming out from Mount Assiniboine in one particular uh, trip and, uh, and I was thinking this is the fourth time I've measured the Bryan Creek Trail and it hasn't changed. <laughs> Why am I doing this? Why am I back doing it again? But you would take the wheel with you anyway because right. you were doing side trips and things like that that you hadn't done before. Yeah. But then you getting out of there, you well, you might as well measure the trail again and see if it, yeah. if it's changed. <laughs> I mean, speaking of trails, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was, you know, did you have? Well, it's a, a two-part question. Did you have a favorite trail? And if you were going to go out again now and do a seven-day trip, or let's say just something where you're out for a bit, where would you go? Uh, well, as far as the favorite trail question is, that that it's always <laughs> the one you, you do the next time. When, when the weather is beautiful right. and you're up high and, and it just turns into a perfect day, and there are a lot of those, yeah. and, and they keep, kept changing, you know. Nowadays, it's a little tougher because this is the big difference between what when we were doing the initial edition of the trail guide everything was free ah. we didn't pay anything right and we didn't have campgrounds we camped wherever we pleased it was random camping everywhere <laughs> wow okay so that i did not know yeah okay and in fact i was talking to lonnie claddle who's the daughter of tony claddle who is one of the pioneer wardens up in jasper park and lonnie was talking we were sending I was talking about stopping by the warden cabin where her father was and when she was probably just a kid running around in the yard <laughs> and I <laughs> and she said that particular summer her father was the first to decide that they needed designated campgrounds oh. in the Tonkin Valley <laughs> yes, they they would have. Yeah, yeah, and because people were just camping wherever they pleased in yeah. there, and in fact, we, we did it that summer when we went in. <laughs> the bugs were so. Oh, horrendous. it's awful out there. <laughs> <laughs> bugs. We, we got hit hit by the bugs. <laughs> it was a beautiful weather, but we camped up high uh, overlooking the valley, and then <laughs> Bart had done it the summer before, so we didn't really need the distance. We were just going out and covering a lot of stuff in the se subsequent summer. The, Bart had covered in 1970. Right. And uh, so uh, we just packed up in the morning and got out of there because the bugs were so bad. I can relate to that. Yeah, Tonk went bad that way. I haven't been back since the early 90s because I just thought, well, it's, and now they're closing, it's busy. And now they're closing the lodges in there too. That's right. Yeah, a yeah. lot of changes in the parks. Yeah. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. But listen, back to equipment. You mentioned your backpack. <laughs> I'm thinking external frame, old school backpack when you started? Uh, yeah, usually uh, metal frames, things yeah. like the Jansport and everything. Yeah, they, yeah. they were yeah. doing variations on the old Trapper Nelsons, you know, with an external frame. Right. But pr pretty quick on, we went to internal frame, like the low. Yeah, uh, when they came in, when they, you know, yeah, when they were... By, they did come in that first decade. Well, backpacking really took off in the 1970s and uh, in the states as well as here. The book originally was published primarily for Canadians and for Americans, mm -hmm. but then 
in subsequent years why we, we start seeing people coming from all over the world. Absolutely. To, to, yeah. To, to hike here. But the core has always been, uh, I think, southern Alberta and Calgary and places like that. That was where the book really had a big impact. Right. And, uh, well, people are so close. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Oh, let's do this trail this weekend. And, you know, that kind of thing. And the thing that they had never had until 1970, when, 71, when the book came out, was A, even the accurate distances mm. and measured with the trail wheel, but also photography. Our photographs were awful in this, <laughs> in the, in this edition. <laughs> let's have a look. Well, I'll flash something up here. Well, Bart had even. Yeah, well, they're fine. That's not bad. Yeah. But what, what you realized is that people had never seen a lot of these no, locations. Exactly. They, they had the little printouts from Parks Canada, right. but no photographs. No. <laughs> were these taken in color at the time, or were they taken in black and white? They were taken in black and white. Okay. So I carried two heavy single lens reflex cameras with me because I was shooting color as yeah. well as black and white okay. color for myself, more right. or less. But the black and white was going to be used in here. Uh, in more recent times, like after about the third or fourth edition, we started using color slides and converting them to black and white. It right. became easier. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you must have quite a collection of those square slides somewhere. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've got lots of binders in the basement. So that's what I wanted to ask you. So the new edition, which is beautiful and in color, yeah. Are these your photographs from back in the day? No. Okay. This was the first time that the book that we did, uh, this is the 10th edition, and all nine editions prior to this was primarily uh, my photographs and Bart's photographs. Right. And, uh, but then Andrew Hempstead, who now owns Summit Out Publishing, decided he wanted to use all digital okay. in the yep. newest edition. Yep. And as a result, and he was doing a lot of hiking himself and taking a lot of pictures on day hikes. Yeah. Uh, even though I had, a, a, I probably had about a dozen decent uh, digital photographs that could have been used on ter trails, but I just backed off and we allowed the people who have been using the book for all these years who, <laughs> to contribute. Who to contribute? Yeah, and uh, and a lot, most of them nowadays, of course. In those days, we were very careful with the amount of pictures we took. You'd go on a long oh, backpack and yeah. maybe a half a dozen pictures because yeah. uh, slide film was not easy. Or well, inexpensive. how did you manage the film? Like from freezing and stuff? Did you sleep with it? Oh, no. No? That, that wasn't the problem. Okay, no, okay. No, Because I thought about that. I thought, gee, film is fragile. And we didn't hike in conditions like you're going to be facing this week. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like it's, a, it's that, beautiful, it's just chilly. I said the, late, <laughs> the latest I ever hiked, I think, was uh, backpacked anyway, it was October 9th or something. That's right, you like mentioned the 9th, yeah, right around Thanksgiving. And this is a bizarre year. Yeah, so just so you know, we're doing this in mid October, and right now I'm sitting in BC. And yeah. it's the next two weeks are going to be stunning. And he's heading for the rock wall, and, right, <laughs> and for four or five days on the rock wall. This is the conditions that are predicted for the next week. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I'm very lucky. Unusual. Yeah. I'm going to switch gears here. I mean, um, and we talked about this before. One of the things I love about the book is that when you are between editions, you go online and you provide mm -hmm. trail updates. And I find that valuable. And there have been a lot of trail updates over the last five or six years. And I want to ask you, a, a, I don't want to put you on the spot, but like a personal question. As somebody who's hiked all of these trails, how do you feel every time you have to go online and say, decommissioned, decommissioned, <laughs> decommissioned, this is gone now? Like, is there a, is there a, a, an emotional or a, uh, you know, is there a, a response inside you? Do you feel anything? I, I have dealt with frustrations with Park, Parks Canada over the several decades, yeah. but uh, I, I think a lot of modern, modern day hikers like yourself <clears throat> um, you probably feel it more than we do because we, we we look at what Parks Canada does, we watched how the warden service was decimated. Oh, it changed completely and did yeah. all these divisions and stuff, right? I, I was working as a park naturalist when uh, they decided to start charging back <laughs> with the wilderness pass. Sure, and, yeah, and, yeah. And things yeah. like that. And, 
<clears throat> reserving campsites and things. And uh, I fought it tooth and nail. And in fact, one of the old wardens who was a next door neighbor when I lived out in Harvey Heights on the park boundary. Right. Uh, he had been a longtime friend and he was the one that was supposed to sell this idea to the park naturalists, you know. Mm. And I, I just, I feel bad to this day that I attacked him so few. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then you were passionate about it, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was ridiculous as far as I was concerned because all of a sudden you knew that, oh, yeah, all the money's going to be put back into that country. No, 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 no. no. Why is it BC Parks can go ahead and do what they do? Amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. and on a budget that was always infinite right. compared to what Parks Canada's budget was. Yeah. And, uh, no, it was just... It so you're, it frustrated you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's frustrating that the general policies were there, you know, and, and, and the directions that they were going. You could see, you could see it coming when a new administration had come in and they decided, okay, well, this parts Canada thing has a minor interest to us. And, you know, so. Well, <clears throat> when I was out, well, you know, when I was out uh, on ancient wall with Jenny, and I sat down and did a little thing on the video about how I think I missed the boat. And you mentioned a minute ago about you know the modern hikers or whatever, but I mean, I did miss the boat. Like when we found Topaz, old Topaz campsite, I was like a geeky nerd. I couldn't believe, I was just so happy to find this old campsite. Yeah. And well, the other one I found was the old uh, Blue Creek hiker camp, which yeah. is across this little creek back far, but there's views compared oh, to that. Yeah. But I mean, to find these and, and they're, they're I mean, according to the parks, they're gone now. <clears throat> they're still there. Well, they but just they're eliminated gone. these recently. Yep. Those were there until, and in fact, a lot of these were informal outdoor campsites. Of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the early days, before we had to start reserving campsites and things like that, why, uh, <clears throat> that, that's where you stayed, you know? And, yeah, yeah. And uh, even sometimes, like yourself, uh, getting caught uh, camping on, in front of the warden cabin. <laughs> well, I only got caught because I, I said a few things online that I shouldn't have said. I do that sometimes, thank you. But uh, yeah, that was not a good, I didn't feel good about well, that. Well, what's so funny about that is, <laughs> in the early days, this was always the case with, well, there's an outhouse nearby. And that's, that's right, that's there's an outhouse in a big open field. This is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Wardens always put themselves in the best spot. <laughs> the best places, the views, it's unreal. You're, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and in fact, there's so many side stories here. One of them was, I just had a, a friend ask me about Larry's Camp. Yeah. How did Larry's Camp get that name? And we discovered that it was Larry Gilmar, who was a park warden, who was sent up there in fairly recent times to establish a campsite for hikers. And he ended up, and the, the joke was, Larry had sighted the camp in just about the buggiest area he could find <laughs> because he obviously had no love for hikers. <laughs> no love for the backpackers. There's not a lot of love still for the backpackers for some people. I mean, but anyway, no. So you and I've talked in the past, you know, via email, and I've said it on videos that this, you have to have the book. I've always said that. YouTube videos do not replace this, but do you ever think back and wish or thought, you know, it's too bad we couldn't have had a vi some sort of video to accompany the book as a sim like a symbiotic kind of relationship? Well, right? that's actually occurred uh, oh. through videos like your own. For example, the one that you just posted uh, this, this month yeah. on trying to get up to Athabasca Pass. Yeah. <clears throat> When we traveled there, the bridge over Simon Creek was there, yeah. and we barely took note of the creek as we zoomed across it. But uh, yeah. all of a sudden, when I saw your videos taking in early September mm -hmm. of what a raging torrent that creek is. It was unbelievable. And I just thought, oh, I can see why Parks Canada is saying, don't try to afford this at any time of the year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you said that, you've actually said that when you did your trail updates, yeah. you said uh, late September, if at all. Yeah. And I think the if at all is probably yeah. realistic. Well, maybe once the ice forms. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> like, okay, we'll walk across it. I don't think it's going to form for a while. No, the speed. No, no, but it's glacial fed and it was hot. 
Yeah. You know, there's no rain event happening, right? It's a glacial fed that's creek. What, that's what you learn when you're in the front ranges in the spring. If there's a rainstorm, look the, out. The, the rivers and streams are going to come up. Yeah. Back in the main ranges in the August when the sun is out, that's when the, the streams come up because the glaciers are exactly. getting hit by that. And it was hot, really, yeah. really hot. Like Jasper was in the what mid to high twenties. Yeah. You know, and that and that those glaciers that feed Simon are all getting sun. They're getting sun all day. Yeah, the way they face right. And big forest fires going when you were there. Cheddarman uh, had just started. Yeah, yeah. If you look at forest fires too, we never used to have forest fires. Uh, we had a forest fire when I first came to the Rockies in 1968 uh, in Vermilion Pass, and that was the first forest fire in over 20 years. First forest fire of any size. Now they are continuous, particularly in Kootenay Park. Oh, it's and every yeah. summer. Yeah, every summer. Yeah. And, and and smoke. It's trying to get clear pictures nowadays. Forget it. Yeah. In in our day, in our day, it was cloudy weather, and we always used to say gray days in the Rockies. You yeah. Know? yeah. <laughs> because all our photographs had clouds, and it took us about three editions <laughs> of the book to get those clouds. All those sunny pictures. Keep going out and re-photographing until you get nothing but sunny pictures. <laughs> Nowadays, it's smoke. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, we've even got a website called firesmoke.ca where they predict yeah. they predict where the smoke's yeah. going to go. Like, I mean, who would have thought we'd need something yeah. like that? No, it's a shame, really. And in fact, just driving down from uh, Canmore mm -hmm. to where we are now, coming down 93, there was a lot of burn. Yeah. It's old. A lot of burn in that valley as well. Getting back to your, uh, your topic about uh, using film yeah. to... And, and, trail updates that was one of the problems in the first eight editions of the trail guide right up until uh the year 2000 when we came out with i think the eighth edition in that year that uh that was the seventh edition maybe but at any rate we have no way we had no way of updating things in between right you know and if right. the book were, was didn't really come out with a new edition for five or six years things could change oh, well yeah. and nowadays things change well instantaneously even our trail updates are, are, old. are old yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but when you have the internet once the internet became popular uh, around the time that uh, Andrew Hempstead our current publisher bought Summer Thought um, then we had that opportunity to sort of update things and, mm. and, and be a little bit more fluid with, with uh, how we get, got the information. Well, and it's, I've actually counseled, we have some local trails in my home province, something, for example, called the Fundy Footpath. And I've actually said to them, look, between your map and book editions, you should do what the Canadian Rockies Trail Guide does and yeah. provide some updates when things change. They didn't want to do that. They thought it might hurt next edition sales. But, but I'm like, <laughs> but no, <laughs> I, I can't take the internet with me. I can take a book, but yeah, yeah anyway, so it's, well, a, it's a good thing. Yeah, and the same thing with paper maps. Uh, our publisher has just pub or, uh, purchased Gemtrack oh, maps. Oh, great. He now owns that. He has for the last they were years. They were the best in a lot yeah, of ways. In yeah. fact, uh, I was hired by Parks Canada to do trail descriptions for the trailhead signs that you see particularly in Banff National Park. Yeah. And uh, they used gem trick maps to illustrate those. Yeah. Those no, they're excellent. Things. Oh, good. That means there might be a revival of those. Yeah. Great. And, and uh, surprisingly, Andrew's really done a good job of keeping them up to date. He's doing an incredible amount of work because <laughs> map, all those changes that occur now on, on a annual basis right. have to be incorporated. That's interesting because when I was on the North Boundary Trail, my pal Joey had, someone had given him an old map of Jasper National Park and it was an older historic map and there were trails in almost every valley. Yeah. Now when Nash, Nat Geo, for example, when they update a map and a park closes a trail, they just erase it from the map. Yeah. But the track is still there. Yeah. So it'd be kind of neat if Gem Trek, suggestion, <laughs> had a historical trails map, even yeah. though they're decommissioned, so that guys like me could see where there used to be a trail, because it's still there. <laughs> well, that was the other thing. That was one of the big expenses when we started up uh, doing the first edition of the trail guide. You need to purchase one to 50,000 maps for the entire... <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah, days. exactly. And in those days, you didn't have full quadrants 
they were half quadrant maps, <laughs> and we purchased each one as as a half. Like for example, Waterton, yep. the eastern part, half of Waterton Park was called Waterton Park. That was a one to fifty thousand map. The western half of the park was called Sage Creek, and that was a totally separate map. But they fit together, and you got a coverage of Waterton Park. <laughs> <laughs> And it was before Parks Canada started publishing more maps. And they were all made in the 1980s when they had the big centennial of uh, right. parks. They uh, published uh, a number of big maps covering Jasper. And of course, a lot of people will say, well, why not just use digital maps on phones? And well, you can like, now. Yeah, you can now. But what if but, your phone breaks? But they still don't have the coverage. You no. still don't get the scope of landscape that you get with a paper map. And I think that's one reason that paper maps may outlive books, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think they might. And you're, the, yeah. the scale is a very important, that's a, an yeah. amazing point to make. When yeah. you look at that map, the scale is in front of you. Yeah. Right. I taught the girls how to read maps. I taught them how to look at a map and then look at the topography. Yeah. There's the valley, there's that wall. You're gonna, you know, be, but you can only see that yeah. perspective on a large piece of paper. Yeah. Right? And people are, according to what I hear on, <laughs> on the internet, are having trouble with gay and things like that, where they're yep. getting misled. And uh -huh. uh, I know Andrew was uh, very concerned that I was using, uh, uh, what is it, all trails. Yes. I was yeah. using all trails when we were doing the, uh, the revision to this edition of the trail guide. And I don't take all trails literally. It just it gives me a sense of where people are going because in a lot of the day trips that we did many years ago, and not that many years ago, uh, people were only going to a certain point. But now people, are, especially in the high country, are creating their own trails just right. by thousands of people going beyond where we said the trail ended. And now these trails, and things like all trails show you trends. You know, you may not want to follow the routes that these people are recording and putting into all trails, but you will see that they're going beyond where we used to go and they're going specifically up to this area yep. and coming back and, or doing a loop. And they're finding calls to two to, to yeah. crawl across here because it's a low point. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I use the first app you mentioned on my iPhone and I've never had problems because I know where I'm going. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, you use a variety of exactly. information and, That's right. and this is it. Don't take this as gospel, but use it as a... It's as an assistant. Support. Yeah. Assistant. Really. Yeah. yeah. Let me switch gears because I, and you know, I'll wrap it up for you, but um, I'm over 50 now, in case, in case anyone didn't know that. <laughs> and I'm thinking of doing a part of, on my YouTube channel, a thing called Hiking Over 50. Yeah. Okay, for people that are getting older, we have different uh, different needs and requirements. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not, and we don't go the same distances that we used to do, right? Yeah. But when did you guys stop doing long trips? Like, how old were you? Or are you still doing them? I mean, oh, I no. don't want to assume that. I'm just, no. like, when did you say, you know what? I've seen all this. I'm done. I'm going to sit in the house and, and yeah. you know. Well, this is it. When you, you're doing it as you, you're living, well, it wasn't really a living, I think it's more of a hobby. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, it's, I haven't gone out for at least 20 years. Wow. I've, I, for the record, I've invited you a couple of times. Yeah. Remember we were trying to, trying and, to find and, the park and, boundary on the Rocky I, Pass? And 20 years takes me back <laughs> to older than you are now. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah. Well, I'm not quitting anytime soon as yeah. if the body cooperates, but yeah. it's just you something... Have a, you have a few, few accidents. I've been very lucky. I, I fell out of a tree about five years ago and shattered, I've like, got 12 screws in my right knee now. But it hasn't really affected my hiking, except I think for backpacking, it would be uh, to have the endurance to get up the next morning and take off. Well, the off weight too, right? Yeah, yeah, you find that it stiffens up on you. So as a result, you know, and also the mountain parks started to get the old hat for absolutely for me yep. and a lot of people 20 years ago. Yep. Uh, it, it was just at the point you had to pay. 
Right. I, I couldn't afford it anymore. Right. No, and, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't afford, like, I, I don't know what it's going to cost you. I don't know, maybe you're outside of the res reservation period to do the Rockwall Trail this week. Right. Or, oh, we already paid for it. You, yeah. yeah. So that usually comes to around $90 a person. Yeah, I something. forget what I pay, but, it, you know, it's expensive and because yeah. you have your reservation fee. Although, you, if you do it the day before, they apparently don't charge that. Yeah. But I, I'm not that kind of person. I need to have my plans all yeah. set, yeah, ready to go. Yeah. Safe, and huh? speaking of Rockwall, I mean, one of the cool things about hiking this time of year, mm -hmm. when I started looking to do a hike and chatted with you about coming out when I saw the weather, and of course, I own my own business and I own bakeries and I had to be there for Thanksgiving Saturday, which is one of our busiest days of the year, or I would have been out the week before when it was yeah. even hotter. Yeah. But um, I like to have my plans. When I was looking online at the Parks Canada Reservation System for this week, every single campsite in Banff and Kootenai National Park, didn't ha not one had a tent pad reserved. Uh -huh. The entire national park in Banff back country was empty yeah at least with reservations <laughs> yeah. i mean you know but isn't that remarkable yeah it's yeah. remarkable it just shows how the season just suddenly ends just like poof. yeah yeah exactly and when october comes people and they're not used to weather like this no so. <clears throat> no this is so amazing it's ridiculous they, they would feel that they were going to be in snow if they were going up high or something like that and, uh, and there's none <clears throat> Of course, there's a lot of problems with the reservation system right now, you know, there's, and this is reservations throughout park systems mm. like BC parks and everything, uh, can mask this country. People who have enough money reserve and then they don't use them. Right. Or, on the other hand, you have got your reserve site for the back country, you get there and all the sites are full. <laughs> Which one of you is the person who is camping illegally? <laughs> Can I see your permit, please? That stuff drives me crazy. I've met people on the trails yeah. uh, in very remote areas yeah. where there's nowhere they could have just walked on. And I knew the day before I'm hiking that I have these campsites alone and then I run into somebody. Yeah. Well, you know they're not on the reservation system. No. I, and again, I don't, I don't personally care. <laughs> But it does, it does drive you nuts. Bart worked uh, at the visitor center in Bath just recently, and, yep. and over the last decade. And uh, the, his supervisor was, realized what the problems were in the back country. But, well, we don't have wardens anymore, so maybe we'll just have vigilantes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm not going to take that on, but, but I can understand why. Because, yeah. you know, for those of us that follow the rules, yeah. It drives you crazy when people don't because it's only going to end up hurting us down the road somehow, yeah. right? Really, so. And uh, part of the part of the problem is, really, you could afford to have a custodian at every campsite if you wanted to have them. Yeah. It used to be in the very old days that and there were only a couple of wardens that were really good at this. Uh, the warden would go and visit popular campsites every night. Sure. And Hi, how are you? Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, and just talk to people. Not necessarily checking your permit, you know. It was just to find out what people were doing. Because they didn't have permits. <laughs> right, no, right. Well, I met a warden at uh, the hike we mentioned earlier where I got in a little bit of uh, hot water. And you know what? Rightly so. I broke yeah. a rule. Fair enough. Speaking of rule breaking, right? Yeah. I didn't know I was breaking a rule, and I've addressed that already on video. I yeah. really didn't. I thought I had permission to do what I needed to do. Fair enough. But I met a warden that night. He had been the warden, uh, district chief yeah. warden at Willow Creek, and yeah. we talked about this type of warden and backpacker um, yeah. interaction. He used to do it himself. Yeah. He talked to him about the area, little education. Yeah. It's nice, I think. It's a nice way to interact. So now the way they interact, they watch videos. <laughs> exactly. They're not in the back country. And then anymore. we get in trouble for posting a video. Yeah, yeah well, but that's yeah. how they can patrol. Because yeah. the average park employee who wears park uniform, which a lot of people think is a warden, they are not. And they're not allowed, by the union itself, has right. decided that they shall not try to enforce any Parks Canada rules. Right. So as a result, they're a crew, or crew or they're right. back there studying fish or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, they're not real wardens. 
they don't have guns on their hips. If they don't have flak jackets, they're not a real warden. Yeah. So the first time I saw a warden in a flak jacket was at Fundy National Park in my province, <laughs> my home province, and I'm looking at these guys going, what do they think's gonna happen out here? Like, it was a bit shocking to me to see a flak jacket. Now, the sidearm, okay, but the, the bulletproof vest? You're a park warden, but yeah. they're law enforcement now. So that last question, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up, but what did you think when the Park Service took the wardens and split them up into all these different divisions? Like, you've got your law enforcement, you've got fire wardens, you've got conservation officers, you've got all these different... One guy used to do most of the work. Yeah. And now it's split up. Well, <clears throat> it's a funny thing. One of the good wardens that we met in the early years, in the 1970s, was Billy Bloom, is his name. And Billy said, you know, Brian, what killed the warden service? And I was going, 1970s, uh, is the warden service dead? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What do you mean, it's dead? He said, yeah. the union. Ah. And in Billy's day, when he started in 1955, each warden had a district, yep. and they lived in it year-round. In fact, I knew one warden who was up on Blue Creek in the uh, north end of Jasper, and yeah. he was up there with his family, his wife and children. At that, uh, at that warden winter. cabin at Blue Creek? And, and the, and the it's Lil. park superintendent gave him permission to shoot elk if he needed food. <laughs> <laughs> and this was <clears throat> this was not that long ago. <laughs> wow, that's amazing to me. Yeah. What a life that would. I mean, listen, yeah. I do it for a year, yeah. like, but the winter would be. <clears throat> and Billy Vroom was one of the first to use cross country skis to get into his cabin in the winter time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, But he was a modern warden. He he was a cowboy from southern Alberta, but yeah. he, he also was a good mountain climber, sure, and skier and. Uh, so he was. He slept in so in the winter, he wouldn't have had horses there, or would he have had horses no, there? No, no. no, horses would be back wherever. I met one warden up in Jasper, up on Newsorn Creek, who had his horses taken away from him because he had all he was always losing them. <laughs> and that was part of the. Do we want to name names? No, we don't want to name names. <laughs> well, and so he was patrolling in running shoes. <laughs> <laughs> But he lived with Warden Cabin. <laughs> so let's listen. I mean, that any these are great stories. Anything crazy you want to share? Any crazy stories? Animal encounters other than the porcupines that want to eat the salt off your no, boots? No, really. Everybody <clears throat> thinks that we were challenged by bears. But like I say, when I was down in Glacier Park in Montana, far more grizzly yep. encounters yep. there. Well, I, it's more compressed space, yeah. right? Yeah. But uh, also more bears. Yeah. But uh, here. Outside of the first summer, we were doing measuring the skyline trail up in Jasper. Yep. And uh, we got up on the top there, and we were just about three quarters of the way across. My partner had lost her bear bell that had left at the campsite the night before. We camped right at Curie Lake, by the way. Yep. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so uh, she was concerned about bears, and uh, all of a sudden, this guy comes along with his son, and he doesn't have a pack on his back, and we're up there halfway across from the skyline, and he jumps across the trail and he says, I'm the guy that was attacked by the grizzly bear here last year. And I remember reading the story in, in the paper, and uh, he says, and I just had the warden drive us up to Signal Mountain Fire Road so that we wouldn't have to encounter that bear who was still there. <laughs> <laughs> really, uh, very few wildlife encounters. Maybe that's always because I'm watching my wheel. Maybe you're not looking up. It <laughs> doesn't matter. Listen, when we backpack now, you, the way the trail system is now, you're always looking at your feet anyway. Yeah, exactly. So you're, it's like, oh, look, scenery. And then well, you're back down like this. Well, that's the other thing. And it's different from when, what you guys encountered today is we could do something like the North Boundary and never get our feet wet. <laughs> Bridges, bridges, bridges. Bridges yeah. are everywhere, and yeah. bridges are not being replaced now, especially no. in Jasper. How do you feel about that? I mean, I asked you earlier about the decommissioned trails every time you got to put one on the website, but, uh, you know, we touched on this earlier, and I don't want to ask the question again, but, I mean, you know, this, this has been your life. This yeah. is a huge part of your life, and do you ever sit back? Well, that's a two-part question. Let me ask the first one. Do you ever sit back and think about that, like, you know, what... What will this guide look like in 20 years, let's say, right? Yeah. I mean, what's going to be left except the big popular trails? Yeah, I would say that the backpackers like yourself are the ones that use the book the most now. Yeah. 
there are so many sources for day trips now. You just go on Pinterest and you'll find <laughs> 500 people writing with beautiful photographs about the best day hikes in Bath Park, the right. best day hikes in there. People are getting their information on that type of hiking a lot yep. more. When we started out, everybody was interested in day hikes and the backpacking wasn't that big a thing. Right. But now, well, for one reason, the trail guide in 1980 sold around 13,000 copies in mm -hmm. one year. Today, it's down to less than 2,000, and it generally is because people are getting their information from other sources. Yeah, but again, as I said earlier, and I've said it in videos, this is not a re YouTube is not a replacement for this book. There's too much information in here that nobody on YouTube yeah. could ever share, or nobody on Pinterest could ever share. Yeah. Like the details that we yeah. talked about earlier. And if you're really gonna hike some of these remote trails, honestly, you want details. Yeah. This isn't Skyline if you're doing the North Boundary. <laughs> like, I mean, really, it's not. You well, need we, the details. We've got a gal here in town who runs a trail running shop. Yep. And the, the trail guide has never sold well there. And the backpack I tried it one year and it, it didn't sell very well at all. But I was going to take a copy down to the present owner and just tell her, Keep this on as a reference because, for my to my mind, this is a great guidebook for trail runners. If you want to go into Lake O'Hara, how do you get to Lake O'Hara? Right. A trail runner could go up that fire road, and then trail runners don't run all the time. No, no, they can't. They're, they're, right. fa they're yeah. fast hikers, and uh, you could do the Opaven Plateau and be back down. And in fact. I did that back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. We got into running and... and oh, did you? Uh, oh, yeah. But I, I was always carrying a lot of camera equipment, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and oftentimes with a bicycle wheel. But, uh, yeah, if I were just wanted to go in and get a photograph, say, like a, uh, I did uh, Nima Pass to Florida Lake. Yep. We did that as a half-day hike and, and ended up jogging all the way out because we had running shoes on. Fantastic, know? yeah. But this is the way I think people can use it, especially with our trail distance outlines that are in the book. Yep. Uh, they can have a good reference as to how far they're going and they can get up there and back in a day. Well, this is happening on Bird Lake. <clears throat> it is and, now, and, yeah. And, until, yeah. Until Bird Lake got wiped out yeah. uh, a couple of years ago, and it's closed now. It is, yeah. Uh, people were going, and they could bicycle up to Kenny Lake Campground. Mm. They could bike there, and then they had it because they couldn't get reservations and any of the campsites. The, Too right, busy. The, the reservations are gone in a, in a millisecond yeah. when they open up in the spring. Yeah. And so people are day hiking. Well, I worked up in Robson for a while, and uh, one summer, and uh, I think the campground curator was the, was the only person who tried the day hike to, to Bird Lake and back because she only had one day to go <laughs> off. That's a big hike. Nowadays, that's quite common, and yeah. now with electric bikes, people are yeah. using electric bikes. And Take parks, me up the hill. Parks yep. haven't quite figured out how to deal with these different modes of transport that people are using, right. even though bicycles were always considered to be okay on certain trails. True, yep. Now with electric bikes, I don't know. Interesting. <clears throat> and uh, yeah. Certainly would raise the risk of an animal encounter. Oh, yeah. I yeah. would think. Well, yeah. I, I, I biked up to Kimmy Lake and Beyond once, way back when, at least 30 years ago, uh, when mountain bikes first came out. <clears throat> and I always hated it because <laughs> I would come up behind hikers, <laughs> and they were always startled. Even, oh yeah, even, always. Even if you slowed down yep. so that you were just going to try to get by them, yeah. All of a sudden they, they look around over their shoulder and there's a bike. It's yeah. happened to me. Yeah. 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 So you imagine coming up on an animal that way? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's that's oh. that's a trouble. A lot of mountain. It's the bikers that tend to have more problems most of the time with bears than <laughs> than the backpackers. When I was working up in the north end of the park. Uh, <clears throat> There were a couple well-known grizzly bears in the Bow Lake Meadows there, and one of them was called Blondie and the other was called Bagwood. <laughs> <laughs> and one day I was sitting there watching Blondie off, and I had my van, I was in my van, and I went to the her out in the meadows, and the cyclist came along. And all of a sudden Blondie thought, 
that'd be fun to chase a cyclist. Yes, let's chase that. Yeah, something yeah. that's just moving. They're not going to take the bike, no. the biker off usually, but uh, <laughs> usually. <laughs> But let's hope I've, not. I've had a couple of cases that I know about where the bicycles were taken down by this event. Yeah, yeah. But in this particular case, being out on the road or anything like that, <clears throat> and the bear was just hoofing it down the road right after the cyclist who was going <laughs> crazy. And so I just got in my van and I raced up beside the two and then I just pulled off in front of Blondie and sort of forced her over, off into the meadow again. Nice job. <laughs> but later when i was doing a book called bear tales in the canadian rockies i came across the story that bicyclist was a was a columnist for one of the calgary newspapers and he wrote the story up really <laughs> that's phenomenal but he wrote it up more as a case of this crazy guy when they in a, a vehicle was driving <laughs> you saved him probably to be honest <laughs> holy mackerel yeah so anyway uh yeah they, this is what you discover so many years, so much time, you just interchange with all of these people and stories and things like that. It's mm -hmm. not just the animal encounters, you know, it's the weird people you meet and, and, and they're getting weirder, I'll tell you, on some of the day hikes out there. <laughs> oh, they're getting weirder in the backcountry sometimes too. We've met a few people out there. It's like, we met a guy once, uh, I'll just say this, the girls and I were hiking. What were we doing? Brazo. It was a year we were supposed to do North Boundary, but the water levels were too high. So we did Sawback and Brazo out of your book. I mean, yeah. you know, I always call the videos whatever your book says the trail is. That's what I, I yeah. call the video. But so this guy was doing the GDT and he hadn't seen, I don't think he'd seen people for quite a while. And it was an awkward encounter. Yeah. He was solo hiking the GDT and we, we tried to have a conversation with him. And like it was, <laughs> <laughs> okay, you walk that way. <laughs> Four points, just that way. Go ahead. Like. It was it was weird. Yeah. So, uh, but I never worry about it. I mean, no. it's a safe place. You know. yeah. Don't you think? I often get along a lot better with the Europeans who come here to right. hike now than I do the North Americans. And do they ever hike? <laughs> oh man, yeah. they go these long distances. Yeah. I've met lots of Europeans yeah. out there. So that's interesting, and it leads me to my last thing. I mean, you've got a book. Europeans are using it. Uh, North Americans are using it. People from Asia are using it. Yeah. Do you sit back ever and reflect on the impact you and Bart have had on people like me? It's a, that's a big question and it's broad. I mean, you've, and I'll just talk personally, without this book, I wouldn't be doing what I do. You've opened this world up to me with the book. Yeah. I'm not alone. Yeah. I know that. And you must know that. Do you ever sit back and reflect and think, you must be proud, I, for sure. Well, it, it's uh, encouraging, I think, with, particularly with backpackers, that the fact that we did try to do a comprehensive book and that we did do, try to present as much information as we could on some of these remote trails yeah. that are now being used by more serious backpackers like yourself. Uh, the book is not a, a, a source of information for the average day hiker anymore like right. it was at the beginning. But it's now, uh, I don't know, all, all of my virtual friends like yourself right. are in the mid-50s. Yeah. What happens after that? <laughs> I don't know. I better get to work on that series, Hiking Over 50, but just to help out. <laughs> yeah, how, how many more years do you have? And, and for, for, like I say, the other 50-something year old people that I know, and <clears> the <throat> people that are... And the big difference nowadays, too, is uh, there are people who have a certain amount of financial resources that they can pursue this as a hobby right. and as a recreation, whereas a lot of poor hippies back in the 70s could never have thought about going uh, hiking if, right. if they had to pay the money they have to pay now. Well, even but even back then, the equipment alone would have been an impediment for some yeah. people to do the long-distance stuff out in the backcountry, yeah. right? Day hikes are different, but yeah. so you must. But you do. You feel you must feel a sense of pride and accomplishment, because I can tell you that. I mean, I could gush all day. I mean, this this book and even our virtual friendship over the last few years, yeah. it means the world to me. I think more and more in the future, this book will become, as particularly for the remote remote backcountry areas, uh, a book that is created by people. It's sort of like the uh, White Mountain Guide, in, which is 115 years old. And, yeah. And, 
New Hampshire, right? Uh, that uh, it's now edited <laughs> because, well, of course, they have the Appalachian Mountain Club and they have a lot of sources. That they do, provide. yeah. And I think in the future, this is going to be a book that is provided, and it is. In this edition, it's become more of a book of uh, sources. Yeah. You know, uh, we went out there and we measured some of these trails in the beginning. Uh, we've got the accurate distances. We have a few photographs. But in the future, with the way things are changing, I think uh, it'll be people like yourself taking pictures of Simon Creek overflowing. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, Was it ever? And uh, you're, you're going to give people a real feel for uh, what's happening back right there. Mm -hmm. And also maybe holding Parks Canada account for uh, some of the things that they're not doing. We're trying. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> Just to say, to, to put the dot on that eye, I mean, I have a problem as a, just a, a Canadian guy uh, paying taxes and paying my user fees that I can't get to a National Historic Site at the top of Athabasca Pass. It, there's a plaque there. Like, yeah. that's an historic monument that I should have access to. Yeah. And because one bridge has no plans to be replaced, um, yeah, it's a real shame. Your battery's running out? Yeah, that battery just ran out. <laughs> <laughs> this battery's still going. We'll finish up on the iPhone, so. Yeah. Anyway, Brian, thank you very much. Thanks. A real pleasure. Um, you're a, a, a hero of mine for doing this book. Yeah, we could go on for days. We I'm could sure. go on for days. <laughs> Who wants part two? <laughs> yeah. If you have any questions or comments, put them down below. And uh, I just had the best time meeting you. It's been a real honor and pleasure, and uh, I feel like I've met like the king of the Rockies. So, this is the real king. He's going to be out hiking the rock wall in mid-October. <laughs> Starting tomorrow. That video, look for it. Anyway, thank you so much. Yeah. See you soon.